Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Liana and Giovanni, uh, for organizing this, and thank you all for being on the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've actually learned a lot from this uh, webinar series and, and enjoyed going on them and find it particularly useful for amidst all this, uh, you know, the, the pandemic that we're in. So Chris asked me, um, following um, Tony Futterman's talk, to talk about something provocative and perhaps controversial. Uh, he, I think he cryptically urged me not to hold back. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so I thought, you know, I, and I heard Tony's talk, which was excellent as usual, very uh, well-spoken and lucid. lucid. Uh, I can't uh, aim to uh, be, do as well as Tony did, but I'll try. Uh, so I thought, you know, why not talk about this question that's been in my mind uh, and the mind of our laboratory for many years, if not a couple of decades, which is why S1P, which is such a very simple uh, lysolipid, such a, it plays such a key role in multiple organ systems. And I think there's evidence uh, well established that it's essential for vascular and immune function. Uh, and what the things that we've learned from doing, you know, studying this by many, many labs around the world, uh, what can we use, how can we use that information for the current pandemic. So that's what I'm going to try to do today in the next 30 minutes. Um, so let me see. Okay, great. Uh, so the topics I want to cover are my personal views, or at least the views of our lab on how S1P evolved as an essential bioactive lipid mediator for vascular and immune systems. Fo secondly, focusing on the vasculature. The main theme of that is S1B keeps the blood vessels strong, uh, you know, kind of uh, going after our, my, my favorite governor of New York. Uh, he says New York strong. I think S1B keeps the blood vessels strong. Uh, and thirdly, to talk about S1P in the immune system, uh, you can probably, S1B has multiple roles in the immune system, but you can perhaps uh, summarize the mo one of the most well understood functions as this phrase, uh, which is really, should I stay or should I go? Uh, it really positions the immune cells, whether they should travel around the body or whether they should actually stay put and do their job uh, or hold, hold back um, as a memory T cell. Uh, and finally, to, to kind of give you my view about uh, the potential uh, of uh, S1P-based therapy in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So first, um, a little bit of um, uh, chemistry. Uh, if you think about the physiochemical, physical chemical property of S1P, is clearly unique. Uh, it's very resistant to oxidation. It's zwitter ionic. Uh, the pH changes uh, leads to polarity changes, and it's poorly water soluble. You need proteins to keep it in the aqueous environments. It's quite different from uh, classical lipid mediators uh, that are derived from arachidonic acid. Uh, such as prostaglandins, leukotrienes. Arachidonic acid has these 1,4-pentadiene uh, uh, cis structures, which are very prone to oxidation. S1P lacks that. So from the point of view of an oxidative uh, environment, uh, this is actually quite stable. It doesn't get destroyed by oxygen. Um, this is, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the metabolism to this group. This is a, a quick reminder to, to, uh, for me to tell you that S1P metabolism takes place in various parts of the cell. Um, this occurs from very uh, simple uh, organisms such as yeast all the way to humans. Uh, but the unique part about vertebrates is that uh, the extracellular export of S1P 
and activation of SLMP receptors. And that event is vertebrate specific. So because the receptor is, gene, genes are only found in vertebrates. Uh, so it appears that this simple lipid mediator, which the metabolic pathways are present all throughout the eukaryotic kingdom, uh, developed this new function as an extracellular lipid mediator to take care of vertebrate specific functions. Um, a little bit of history. Um, it's been about 50 years since people started working on S1P. Um, the earliest paper I could find was the discovery of it as a metabolite by Stoffel in 1970. Um, at that point, S1P was thought of as a uh, simple metabolite of uh, sphingolipids, which were well known to be major parts of membranes at the time. Uh, in the 90s, uh, labs of Gill, Spiegel, and Igarashi started working on the bioactive aspect of S1P. Uh, the prevailing notion at the time was that this was more akin to second messengers, such as cyclic EMP or calcium. There were alternative views, for example, those espoused by Kevin Lynch, Walter Molinar, suggested that they might actually be a uh, receptor for this uh, lipid after secretion. Uh, we stumbled on this field about 20 years ago. Uh, we provided, we believe, a formal proof that S1PR1 is a uh, G-protein couple receptor, high affinity receptor for S1P. Shortly thereafter, uh, Rick's lab, Rick Proya's lab, provided the key genetic evidence that S1PR1 is actually essential for vascular development. In the absence of this gene, um, the mice, uh, the ve vessels in the mice uh, embryos are very fragile, they lead to hemorrhage and death. Uh, suggesting that S1P is an essential um, um, lipid mediator for vascular development. Um, another serendipitous discovery in the field was the discovery of FTY720 originally in Japan. Uh, further work by Folke Brinkman and Suzanne Mandela's uh, group at Merck, uh, including uh, Kevin Lynch uh, at UVA uh, with working with Brinkman, and Hugh Rosen, uh, who was the boss of uh, uh, Suzanne Mandela at the time, uh, they had two very key papers that showed that this uh, FTY720 is a sphingosine analog and acted on S1P receptors to regulate immune cell trafficking. Uh, this uh, was quickly followed by the genetic demonstration that S1B receptor 1, the same receptor that regulated vascular development, is critical for immune cell trafficking, the work by Sister and Pruria uh, in separate labs. Uh, and finally, uh, Fingolimod, uh, which is the uh, trade name for FTY720, was approved 10 years ago, 2019-2020. Uh, separate related uh, compounds, saponamide and ozanamide were approved for multiple sclerosis to treat autoimmune diseases. And th uh, last year, there were at least 900 publications with the word sphingosine. So this field is very vibrant and, and it's in the clinical arena and we've certainly learned a lot from many different labs. Um, so our view of S1P receptors uh, is that um, S1P receptors respond to S1P uh, that's extracellular and present in a gradient form. The gradient is created by extracellular enzymes such as LPP3, the transporters, and chaperones to make S1P soluble. Uh, the receptors are also regulated uh, by cofactors. Uh, they have to be on the cell surface to be active and uh, they transduce signals primarily through G protein to regulate not only the immune system, but multiple organ systems in both physiological and pathological situations. Um, the three FDA approved drugs and many others in testing 
are functional antagonists. And what the way they work is that they take this receptor from the cell membrane to the endosomal and intracellular compartments, and that leads to an S1P null state uh, and, and uh, inhibit, for example, immune cell trafficking to achieve uh, autoimmune uh, efficacy. Um, so certainly a lot of work, uh, this is an oversimplification, but certainly a lot of work uh, in this area and much to be learned. Um, so, the, so we feel that the receptor-dependent biology has uh, both cellular genetic pharmacologic uh, basis in both, um, you know, in, in every system that's been looked at in vertebrates, uh, including clinical situations. Um, uh, so the metabolic role of S1P is also, I believe, uh, well established. There is strong genetic evidence. Uh, and it's emerging. Um, um, we know that there are inherited deficiencies of S1P lyase that leads to uh, kidney development disorders and so on. Um, and um, we know, we have learned that um, S1P as a terminal metabolite is involved in fatty acid metabolism, uh, choline and ethanolamine-based metabolism and phospholipid metabolism in, in both uh, mice and other organisms. Uh, and in addition, it's involved in sphingosine depletion and regulate indirectly sphingosine and ceramide levels. So this is a metabolic role for S1P. Uh, the third area that's perhaps more controversial is the intracellular second messenger. It has historic roots uh, I am, want to show this figure taken from Sarah Spiegel's review written about eight years ago, uh, which summarizes the uh, targets, direct targets of S1P, putative intracellular targets of S1P, for example, TRAP2, uh, HDAC, histone deacetylase, PKC delta, prohibitin B uh, in mitochondria, as well as other laboratories have identified since then uh, telomerase, a typical PKC, and hemoglobin A. Um, in, in all cases, there is some biochemical evidence um, suggesting that intracellular S1P could bind to these targets and regulate uh, intracellular signaling pathways as a second messenger or intracellular mediator. Um, about 20 years ago, um, our lab wrote this uh, review article commentary where we raise that controversy exists as to whether S1P acts as an extracellular mediator or an intracellular messenger or both. And I think that statement is still true today. Um, if you contrast S1P with established sec second messengers, for example, cyclic AMP, calcium, and phosphate uh, phosphate, such as PIP3, um, we don't really know in the cell what fraction of S1P is membrane associated versus cytosolic. We know that cytosolic protein concentration is several, uh, several times higher than plasma concentration of protein. So it's just a very crowded environment. And is S1P bound to intracellular chaperones? Do they exist? We don't know. Uh, how does S1P binding regulate confirmation and activity of these putative targets? Uh, some of those targets have directly been um, challenged, for example, TRAP2 and PKC Delta for um, applicability to multiple systems. Um, and whether this effect is constitutive or induced, uh, what's the physiological relevance and genetic evidence? So, these are simply my views that uh, have to be addressed, I think, if we are to accept that S1P does have a bona fide uh, physiological uh, role in, as an intracellular second messenger. So in contrast, uh, I mentioned about the um, uh, solubility problem in aqueous environments. Uh, the transporters and chaperones for S1P make it uh, functional uh, outside the cellular environment. Uh, this is a summary um, of work from many labs. First transporters, uh, there's Spinster 2, uh, which is 
present in many cells, but, but well known to be expressed in vascular cells like, like uh, endothelial cells uh, and MFSD2B recently identified as uh, RBC and other hematopoietic uh, transporters for S1P. Those are really bona fide S1P transporters. In contrast to what's in the literature, the ABC transporters, whether they are in fact relevant as S1P transporters is very much questioned and controversial. Uh, when these transporters work, uh, the S1P is released uh, or flipped on the membrane and picked up by chaperones such as APOM on HDL uh, in the plasma or albumin uh, is an abundant plasma protein that help create an enriched environment in blood, for example. Uh, the tissue levels of S1P are very low. You have this gradient and the lymph S1P level is somewhat intermediate. And in environments such as a limp and maybe CSF and uh, perhaps other chaperones are important uh, where APOM and albumin are lower, even though that is not well established. Uh, we, we recently published a paper that showed that in the absence of albumin and APOM in a double knockout mice, so it's a very artificial situation, uh, APOA4 can substitute for as a S1P chaperone. So at least there are three known chaperones, perhaps more. Uh, just to summarize their properties, uh, we, we know that APOM, which is an HDL constituent, um, binds S1P stably. There's a nice uh, calyx-like pocket uh, that binds to S1P tightly uh, and is protected from degradation from uh, uh, phosphatases and so on. Um, and, um, and there's strong physiological evidence that APOM is relevant as a S1P chaperone. In contrast, albumin, which is much more abundant, 600 micromolar versus two micromolar in plasma concentration, uh, binds, likely binds S1P on the surface via hydrophobic patches. Uh, albumin, uh, um, binding is less efficient than APOM and is less stable. Um, and APOA4, which is this uh, dimer, a uh, long cylindrical dimer can rearrange its helices to accommodate lipoproteins shown here. Uh, it's also uh, uh, similar to albumin in terms of binding to S1P, is not as tight as APOM. The concentration is also a lot lower. So uh, these are what we know about uh, S1P chaperones. We believe that it makes uh, S1P soluble and present in extracellular environments and different biological compartments and activate S1P, uh, S1P receptors. Uh, for example, for APOM, which is thought to be uh, anchored to the lipid core of the HDL particle, signals quite differently than albumin bound S1P. Uh, we can see changes in NF-kappa B inhibition uh, and poor ability to induce endocytosis and regulate GI, uh, suggesting that it may act in a biased mechanism as a biased ligand to this receptor to evoke separate pathways. Um, so, so that was sort of my... Uh, views on evolution and, and what we know and not know about S1P function. And now I'd like to uh, focus on the vasculature. Um, and this, this goes back also about 20 years where we observed that if you add S1P to vascular endothelial cells in vitro, it rapidly tightens cell-cell borders. So this is staining for VE cadherin, which is a cell-cell adhesion protein. This is beta-catenin, which is a cytosolic partner. We worked out the pathway for uh, signal transduction through RAC, which is downstream of S1P R1 and G13, which now we know is downstream of S1P R3, to regulate uh, both uh, focal contact points and adherence junctions and make the cells continuous so that the, uh, uh, the vessels would not be leaky. 
this is a model for vascular barrier function. Um, subsequently, uh, Jihei Pike uh, in my lab, my former student, showed that S1P action on S1P R1 in the endothelium, that the red is the endothelial lining, uh, allows it to adhere to the pericytes and vascular smooth muscle cells during development, uh, providing structural stability to new vessels. Um, this works through a adhesion molecule called N-cadherin. Uh, Jihei also showed that in addition through the row pathway, likely through the S1PR3, which works coordinately with S1PR1, uh, focal contacts and stress fibers are assembled, and that allows uh, sticky uh, adherence to extracellular matrix. So overall, uh, the vascular signaling of S1P receptors, receptor one and perhaps receptor three, allows stable vessels. So it keeps the blood vessels strong uh, after development. Um, during stress conditions, uh, for example, if, you ch if, you, if the endothelial cells are challenged with inflammation or angiogenesis uh, by cytokines and growth factors, it leads to barrier breakage. You can study that in vitro. So if you add vascular endothelial growth factor and follow albumin um, uh, traverse in the monolayer, it goes up. Acute activation of S1P receptor one suppresses that uh, within uh, 30 minutes or so. And you can also study that in vivo if you inject a small amount of VEGF into the ear of a mouse and look at fluorescent dextran leakage from the vessels, you see a rapid increase, which is quantified here. And uh, low dose FTY, acute dosing, uh, inhibits that leakage, which is shown here in a receptor selective manner, uh, or at least an uh, isoform specific manner. The isoform of FTY that cannot be phosphorylated has no. Um, subsequently, we, we and others showed that the S1P receptor 1 is phosphorylated in the C-terminus, particularly in the serine cluster by GRK2. That's essential for receptor endocytosis. If you mutate those residue serines to alanines, that receptor is resistant to endocytosis. Now, if you treat with super high resolution uh, levels of of uh, FTY 720 to induce degradation of the receptor in the wild type mouse. Uh, the receptor is endocytose and degraded, so disappears within 24 hours. In the, this is in the lungs of this wild type mice. But in a knock in mutant mice, we call it S5A mouse, we see enhanced resistance to degradation because if the receptor cannot be phosphorylated, it cannot be. Uh, internalized, but if it's not internalized, it's not degraded. Now that mouse shows attenuated vascular leak. The, the after FTY treatment, you get blue dye in the lungs, which is because of vascular leak into the lung parenchyma. That's what happens during uh, infection or inflammation of the lungs. And the S5A mouse in which the S1P receptor cannot be degraded, is present on the cell membrane, protects the leakage. So we think that endothelial S1PR1 would uh, protect the endothelium in various organs, including the lung, and, and resist uh, insults such as infection and inflammation. Um, turns out APOM levels are physiologically relevant. If you provide HDL that has APOM but not HDL that lack APOM, you can stimulate uh, junctions, as I've shown you. Uh, but importantly, in vivo, if you knock out the APOM gene, and that mouse has about 50% uh, less S1P, mostly bound to albumin, um, you still see enhanced leakage, but no pathology, suggesting that uh, circulating APOM is playing a physiological homeostatic role in keeping the capillary beds in the lung uh, strong and, and not leaky. Um, it's hard to 
we believe that this uh, axis is going to be impaired in various diseases. Uh, a number of years ago, Steve Swendeman in my lab uh, tried to produce APOM that's soluble and easily manufacturable because it's hard to generate HDL with APOM. Uh, multiple proteins and lipids are required. So we made APOMFC. We think it looks like this. We can purify it to homogeneity. We also made a mutant that cannot bind S1P called triple mutant. The S1P binding sites are mutated. And in an endothelial cell barrier assay shown here, uh, if you activate the receptor with S1P ligand like uh, um, HD, uh, APOMFC, the junctions are tightened and, and the resistance across the monolayers uh, is increased because the barrier is increased. And you can see that the blue line is albumin. Uh, you can see an increase in barrier followed by a decline after two hours, whereas APOMFC has a sustained barrier increase. Uh, if, there, if APOM has no S1P, it's inactive. So we, we are quite excited about this reagent as a possible agent to manipulate this pathway in vivo. I should also mention that when Victoria Blaho was in the lab, she showed that in contrast to FTY or small molecule agonists, which will hit both the vas vascular S1PR1 as well as lymphocyte S1PR1, FC only seems to target vascular S1PR1. So we do not get lymphopenia with FC treatment, which may provide additional advantages. Um, very recently, in collaboration with Bisen Ding, we showed that this, this uh, pathway may be relevant in aging. Uh, what Bisen showed was that old mice have low APOM bound S1P in circulation, and this is regulated by sirtuin pathway. This was just published about a month ago, if you're interested. And that, uh, that APOM S1P allows the liver and the kidney to resist uh, injury. For example, for the liver, we use acid-induced, uh, Bisen used acid-induced uh, fibrosis uh, and leakiness. For the kidney, he used ischemia reperfusion injury. And in both cases, um, in old mice, you get worse injury, which is known. But if you supplement APOM, uh, you can get a therapeutic benefit. Uh, this was the old uh, plasma levels of APOM bond S1P, uh, APOM, plasma APOM. This is the young. And this is in the human. I took it out of a um, aging uh, proteomic study from thousands of humans, you can see that as humans age, these are blue is a male, uh, uh, red, uh, pink line is for females. Uh, for males especially, old age is associated with reduced uh, APOM and plasma. Uh, this is highly statistically significant, uh, but not in females, and perhaps leading to why females have better cardiovascular outcomes, and so on. But importantly, Bisen was able to show that in this acid model of injury in the lung, um, in the old mice, um, you see uh, worse injury, uh, which is shown here. But if you, if you uh, provide ABOM FC treatment, uh, you can get uh, attenuated injury, collagen synthesis, and fibrosis, and so on. So this is actually quite exciting, and we, we are very much interested in further developing this line of investigation. Um, so to summarize the vascular system, uh, we think that when the vessels are damaged, uh, there's a lot of cytokines, um, uh, with viruses, you have something called cytokine storm, and S1P is a break for that by allowing endothelial survival, NO release, uh, which allows blood flow, providing barrier function at adherence junctions, and also reduce cytokine storm by inhibiting NF-kappa B and interferon response genes. A little bit, bit of data that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, in the immune system, very quickly, um, 
we have um, this is this is a summary of much data from many many different labs. Normally, S1P in the uh, lymphatic sinuses is critical for immune cell egress. And if you block that with the small molecule antagonist, the receptor in the lymph node is internalized. That cell becomes S1P null uh, and gets arrested. So it's quite useful in uh, inhibiting autoimmune cells from uh, escaping and destroying your organs. But you worry about using this strategy during infections, such as viral infections, because the immune cells have to get out and destroy the virus infected cells. Um, and that's an issue, I think, that have sort of prevented the rapid application of these drugs as potential therapy in COVID patients. Uh, very recently, um, uh, Jason Sister's lab has shown that gamma delta T cells in the cell. Uh, uh, they, if they, if the the signal to stay there is really to inhibit S1PR1 by both CD69 and S1PR2, which inhibits chemokine signals, and and once you have two inhibitory signals, that T cell is blocked from using S1PR1 to escape to lymphatics, where S1P is a lot higher than in the dermis. So that kind of paradigm has also been shown for macrophages by us uh, several years ago during atherosclerosis, where the retention signal is provided by S1PR2. So seems like uh, multiple S1P receptors and S1P that's both systemic as well as local controls these immune cells to move or stay put. And I'm sure there's much to be learned in this area. Uh, so finally, uh, I'd like to close off by um, providing some evidence, uh, uh, some rationale and evidence uh, for the potential of this pathway uh, in uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, um, the lung is a major organ uh, for the S1P action, both in physio physiological conditions as well as in disease. Um, where uh, vascular S1P is critical to keep these vessels uh, non-leaky. Uh, the the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus starts by inhibiting nasal epithelium and then bronchial epithelium, and, and it goes down the, the, the parenchyma of the, the pulmonary tissue and eventually targets the airways, deeper lung structures. And um, once um, viral infected, the, the immune cells are recruited to try to, to control the viral infection, that leads to tissue injury. The host, if the host cannot regulate the infection and recover, it leads to what's called cytokine storm, that leads to systemic uh, decline in other organs, uh, organ failure and death. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, there's edema that's very important, clotting uh, and cytokine storm that, that destroys these tissues. Um, I showed you about the APOM data with the knockout that it put <clears throat> under homeostasis. Plasma S1P is important uh, in keeping lung vessels non-leaky. Uh, this is a paper that we published. Uh, Victoria Blaho was the first author where uh, endothelial-specific S1PR1 knockout has a much higher uh, leakage in the lung compared to APOM knockout. So this is this, and so this is much higher because the receptor um, uh, responds to not just plasma S1P, but also local S1P. I uh, recently we published a paper, uh, Natalie Berg was the first author, and Natalie showed that in a um, complement and cytokine driven uh, lung inflammatory model where you have neutrophil mediated injury and hemorrhage, uh, APOM FC treatment attenuated um, injury, suggesting that uh, this pathway might have some utility to attenuate the cytokine storm induced uh, lung injury. Much earlier than us, Hugh Rosen's lab had a series of very important papers, I think, 
And Hughes Lab uh, developed a, you may know, um, Ozanamod, which is a third approved S1P receptor. It has a shorter acting than the first two. And also it seems has slightly different properties as a pharmacological tool as far as activating different signaling pathways. Uh, what he showed was that locally, uh, Ozanamod homolog CYM5442 uh, inhibited the cytokine storm, which was amplified during influenza virus infection in both mice and ferret models. And if you use it properly with the right dose and right timing, you can actually impact survival outcomes. You get benefit um, in these animal models. And he clearly showed that it's the endothelial S1PR1 that's critical. And I think this is a really important paper for the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, and some data since then, some data from our lab, if you knock out S1PR1 and do transcriptomics, cytokine genes are strongly upregulated. This was published in this paper a few months ago in ELI. Uh, if you look at the promoters of, for example, CCL2 gene, that's a cytokine, you can see that RNA is strongly induced in the knockout. We didn't stimulate with viruses or anything. If you look at the promoter, and look at by ataxy chromatin occupancy, you can see that both AP1 site and NF kappa B site are induced in the absence of S1PR1, suggesting that S1PR1 signaling through the GI pathway restrains uh, exaggerated cytokine responses. Very recently, a single cell study was published in, the, in eLife from uh, UPenn. And in the H1N1 infected lung of mice, clearly the, these are the endothelial cells that are shown in red circles. And those are the cells that express S1PR1, both in normal lung as well as in the H1N1 infected lung. Uh, this is at the peak of disease. So it's really, the receptor is there, uh, but what about the ligand? Uh, interestingly, in humans with COVID-19, and this paper was published in Cell, about a month ago from, from China, um, and they did proteomics and lipidomics of uh, patients that are healthy, green, which would be here, uh, non-COVID, but uh, in the hospital, blue, non-severe COVID patients, that's uh, uh, 10, and very severe COVID patients, which is in the red, and you can see that APOM is downregulated. It's actually a little bit upregulated in non-severe COVID patients, but clearly downregulated with normals in the severe COVID patients. And sphingomyelin, sphingosine, and sphingosine phosphate are lower than uh, controls, suggesting that in some cohorts, um, this plasma S1P uh, HDL pathway may be attenuated. Uh, another paper recently published in the New England Journal uh, that shows that endothelial cells of the lung vasculature, this would be the lung vas vessels around the airway sacs, are uh, very abnormal. And at high power, you can see sort of gaps and holes and, and sort of uh, membrane breakages, which may contribute to uh, the damage of the organ. And by doing transcriptomics, they were able to identify in COVID-specific versus influenza uh, transcriptomics, S1PR1 is present. And it is more associated with the COVID endothelium, suggesting that um, perhaps this is a compensatory response uh, under high, the receptor is upregulated because maybe the ligand or signaling is attenuated. Um, so, and finally, so what would be the um, rational therapeutic, potential therapeutic strategy to protect the endothelium during uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections? Uh, we know that the receptor on the endothelium uh, activates the positive signaling pathways through GI and RAC and promote the barrier. It has a built-in uh, negative feedback loop through beta arrestin receptor endocytosis so that you only get transient response when, when a small uh, amount of receptor is activated or the ligand is, is gone. Um, 
So if you have a beta arrestin bias agonist, which is perhaps um, more akin to fingolimod or simplonimod, uh, and, and given that there's abundance of S1PR1 in the endothelial um, me uh, cell membrane, um, you're unlikely to get benefit um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the vessels. Uh, and in addition, this would lead to T cell suppression. So this would be not what you would want to approach. Uh, Ozanamod, as I mentioned, this is the, the third uh, FDA approved drug, is slightly different in that it's shorter acting, uh, perhaps more biased towards GI biased uh, agonists. We believe that APOM HDL is closer to GI biased agonists. Ideally, uh, perfectly uh, biased GI bias agonists would give you um, uh, perfect um, or optimal endothelial barrier protection without inducing uh, immunosuppression or um, uh, further exaggerating the cytokine storm. Uh, so that would be the rational way, I believe, and, and of course needs to be tested in experiment to see if this hypothesis has any merit. So finally, uh, I think that based on what we have learned, um, uh, I think that S1P, S1PR1 signaling uh, has a potential in this uh, current pandemic that we are all faced with. Uh, we want to consider both immune cells and vascular cells to protect the blood vessels while not, enhance, while not diminishing uh, and perhaps enhancing adaptive immunity early on to control the virus. So conclusions are that I hope, um, if anything, I've stimulated discussion about my thoughts on how S1P could have evolved as an extracellular lipid mediator in vertebrates. And vertebrates, as you know, have a closed vascular system. So they have a, you have to keep the vessels uh, tight as well as the immune cells have to navigate new gates to go in and out of the circulatory system to get around the body. Um, and um, I hope I've shown you some data suggesting that as circulatory S1P is a key regulator of vertebrate vascular and immune systems. Um, talked about the vascular endothelium, strong vessels in the immune system, regulating egress and residency, and some thoughts on whether this has potential to be tried in COVID and other lung diseases. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, um, the, the current lab members. This is actually about two years old. Uh, I've met, and many, many of us uh, discuss these things very uh, actively and, and the lab is really, uh, it, it's really truly a pleasure to be, to have the privilege to work with a very talented uh, scientist in my lab, both currently as well as in the past, in the last, uh, 20 years or more, and I feel truly blessed. And thank you very much for your attention.